School District 622. Um, if you haven't checked us out on social media, please do. We also have a district app. So if you look at, if you go to your app store, uh, School District 622, we have an app that has some information. I'm going to make a quick plug. I know Eric's watching to make sure I do this because Eric also sits on the board of our ed foundation. Um, our 622 Education Foundation, there's a flyer on the table. If you are interested in being involved in public education in all, this is an amazing board. Um, they do some fundraising for a couple of big pieces. Eric is very, very active and generous with his time. Stan's been involved for a long time, as well as his daughter. And uh, I'll just say one story. The first day when I got announced as a superintendent for District 62, um, almost 10 years ago now, the very first person to call me was Stan Karwaski, and he said, Hi, I hope you're going to join the 62 Education Foundation board. And I said, Sure, where do I sign up? So um, this group does a lot of amazing things, but we also are looking for board members. They meet the first Tuesday of every month. Um, it's not a long meeting, and it's on Zoom, and it's easy to participate in, but they raise money that is amazing for our uh, an angel fund. Our social workers in every one of our schools gets a big, nice little budget to work with for students who need prescription glasses, or coats, or jackets, or um, backpack food programs or what have you, things that kids have needs for that we can't pay for out of school district dollars. And so I just wanted to put a plug in there, collecting donations for our amazing um, spring recognition of students. So if you would scan that QR code and make a donation, we'd be most grateful as well. But also think about joining if you have any interest. Here's a look at our school board right now. Um, we have a really wonderful school board that's really geographically well represented of our district. Important to know, some school districts, people are elected by neighborhoods. In 622, they're elected at large. And so, um, for example, you know, we've got Charlotte lives in Woodbury, and yet she still represents all of the school district, right? Um, same thing, Julia lives in Oakdale, they're still representative of the whole school district. That's not the case in every school district, so I think that's kind of interesting to know. On your table, you have a little look at this org chart on the back of one of your maps as well. This just kind of shows you who all is in charge of different departments. We have lots going on. I want to tell you a little bit about who our students are because our student demographics are changing a lot. I think a lot of people, when they look at East Metro, and I talk to people all around the Metro, don't realize how diverse we are here. We are students speak over 70 unique, distinct, different languages. Spanish is one, Hmong is another, over 70 different languages. Think about that for translation abilities here. Um, as you can tell, we are a very, very diverse student population. Um, vast majority of students of color, um, but a really interesting mix. We've also got um, about 66% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. That's how we measure kind of socioeconomic levels of the needs of our students. So we are a district that has a lot of needs, um, and we are very connected to that, and I think one thing we can offer, I always tell this to the city when you're just at Oakdale City Council this week as well, but, or last week, um, because we have a lot of in-house interpreters and a lot of programs that reach out to our families, if you're ever conducting something in the school district or in the city or around the area, and you want to try to make stronger connections, you know, we have a whole system where you can pay a little fee and send out flyers for advertising to different things. But we also have a lot of folks in our work in our district who are very connected to our families and know them very well. Couple quick things, our geography. You have a map of this on your table as well. I won't get into all the details. And I'm not gonna talk all about construction this time because we've spent so many times talking about that. But if you're interested, 
Oh boy, there's a lot going on there. I want to just show you, this is interesting as well. Um, in fact, we can send this visually too, so if you click on that link at the top, it will give you the full list. But I want people to understand too, sometimes we think about our sins, right? So Oakdale, we're in Oakdale right now. What I, what's really interesting to look at is that even though we're in Oakdale, if you look at North High, it has a lot of Oakdale resident students. Our boundaries aren't following city lines. So we have to just keep in mind that even though we have some schools that are physically located in Oakdale and Maplewood and North St. Paul, we do serve across the city boundaries with these as well. It's kind of interesting. I always like to remind North High, you have more Maplewood resident students here than North St. Paul resident students. Of course, North St. Paul is really small, but it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. I want to talk about language immersion programs because this is fairly new for us. Um, we launched, uh, this is our, our second year now, with an immersion, three different immersion programs. Immersion is a program where you can sign a child up for kindergarten, and they can learn in a target language all the way through. Um, we know that, and Ty Thompson, who's with us, who's our assistant superintendent for secondary programs, um, and Ty and I have both spent a lot of years working in immersion programs, even in St. Paul days, and we haven't built one here for quite some time because we were so busy with facilities and all the other things going on. And now we finally have them run. We have a Mandarin Chinese immersion program, we have a Spanish immersion program, and we have a long immersion program. And I'll tell you, the uh, Mandarin program actually here this school year is located at Justice Allen Page Elementary, which is where Maplewood Middle used to be. But this coming year, we're actually moving it over here to Eagle Point. So uh, two of our three immersion programs are going to be in the city of Oakdale, um, with Castle and being Spanish and Eagle Point for our Mandarin. It's important to note that. Even though we have these attendance boundaries, so let's say you live in the boundary area for um, Justice Allen Page Elementary, if you want to choose an immersion program, we'll bus anywhere in our city bound, our district boundaries to get you there. So even though Castle is located in Oakdale, if you're living in North St. Paul or Maplewood and you want to attend that school, if you're in our district boundaries, we'll bus you there as well. Very cool programs if you haven't had a chance to check it out. Um, this is kind of how the program begins. You start with a kindergarten class, and then each year it progresses up. So like in the 22-23 school year, we started with um, kindergartners in our three immersion programs. Those kindergartners this year are first graders. Next year, those first graders will be second graders, and each year behind them, we add in another section. So it grows its way up through the school year, through all the grades. So that's pretty cool to pay attention to. I want to just know because I think we know that there's huge need. There's a lot of folks who are commuting into St. Paul, Minneapolis for emergency pay programs that have waiting lists. And uh, we're trying to get the word out that we have them here now as well. So if you know anyone who's interested, we want to keep that word going. I want to mention that we have a new strategic plan. Um, anytime you want to do a strategic planning process, how do you go about it? Well, we decided that the only way to know how everyone is experiencing our, our school district is making sure we get lots and lots of perspectives. So last year, we spent many, many, many weeks and months putting together surveys and analyzing data, and we brought together a huge, huge um, group of core planning folks, about 60 people, students, teachers, community members, retirees, school board members, to kind of, and we gave them all kinds of data. We dug into kindergarten attendance data and high school suspension data and academic achievement and graduation rates and we spent a lot of time with all that. Every year we hold a big event at each high school where we gather feedback and this is something we do every year from hundreds of kids to tell us what's working in the school for you, what recommendations do you have for us to make it better. Funny thing is sometimes they uh, their first thing I'd like to talk about is the menu for lunches. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, talk about it. Look, we had these lunch chart papers where kids are writing, no more chicken. <laughs> I was like, okay, we hear you. Well, let's figure that out. But we do take that advice. And kids have been asking, we want some more meal options that are more representative of our cultures. Mm -hmm. And our nutrition programs are working on that now. And so feedback really makes a difference for how we improve settings for kids. Um, after combing through loads and loads of data, we identified these core categories for our strategic plan. And we just adopted these core goals um, just in January, and we're working them through this year on all of our school plans 
will be anchored to this initiative plan for the fall. And so this will be our goals for the next three to five years. And as you can see, um, academic achievement, kids graduating from ready for post-secondary, whether that is college, career, trades, military, you name it. We want kids to know their options, and you hear from us all the time of the amazing things our uh, work coordinators do for us in helping kids understand career pathways. Um, safety and security. People really, really have strong feelings. They want to make school feel safe. Um, not just physically, but emotionally, and not just students, but staff as well. And so we made that a top goal, physically and emotionally safe. Social emotional learning, we know if you've learned anything from the pandemic. When kids lose time practicing with each other how to solve problems and get along, they fall behind. Just like we're falling behind in math or reading skills, social skills need practice, right? Every playground argument that happens in kindergarten is a stepping stone to being able to handle something later in life. So we want to make sure kids have opportunities to practice social skills with each other. And um, equity and inclusion, making sure everybody feels valued, welcome, and heard in our environments. One area I just want to pull your attention to because I think it's, it's pretty shocking. If you haven't heard on the news lately, there's a major issue since the pandemic of absenteeism among kids. And it's not just in our district or even in our state, it's a national problem, but it's really serious. And so I want to show you a few bits of data. I mean, we don't ever like to walk around and show our bad news data, but we need the whole world to see like we need everyone paying attention to this. Um, this is last year, so this is a whole school year. And we are on track to improve this. But for last year, this is elementary students. Now, these are the number of kids who missed more than 10% of their school days. Kindergartners, look at that. In elementary, our greatest number of kids missing school are in kindergarten. Um, and so you can see how significant that is. If we want to really recover from academic delays from the pandemic, we gotta get kids to school. Not surprisingly, in middle school, our eighth graders miss the most. And in high school, it's our seniors, not surprisingly, right? Um, and so I just think that's so important for us to keep an eye on. Even in our Office of Early Learning, we have a lot of kids missing school. And one thing I wanna point out, if we, if we have these on the table, Last year, I actually was talking to a couple of our school board members who happened to have kids themselves in kindergarten. Now they're first graders. And I asked them, you know, you're on the school board and you have a kindergarten. Can you name a single learning standard in kindergarten? They couldn't. Guess what? When I was a mom in kindergarten and I was an elementary principal at the time 20 years ago, I was hard pressed to go, wait a minute, no, what do you need to learn? It's that important, because I think sometimes people have the idea that maybe kindergarten is play time, practice time, but like, I love to use this example because it's kind of weird. We wanted to demystify, what do you need to learn here? We didn't put all the learning standards here, because there's hundreds of pages, but we wanted to pick out some that might be easy for parents and family members and community to pay attention to. In kindergarten, but again, you need to read, write, and represent numbers from zero to 31. How many of you thought it was like you need to count one to 10? You know what I'm saying? Like it's different, 31. And read, write, and represent means you have to see the number, you have to be able to write the number 31, and you have to count 31 blocks representing them with physical objects. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in school and I'd like to remind everyone too, it's also practicing getting along with people, taking turns. One way we're trying to really make sure, we know that for kids to be interested in school, they have to feel connected. So we're on a mission to get every single high school student, and middle school eventually too, connected to a club, a sport, an activity, a performing art, something. And we actually track this every trimester, and we report on it to our school board. Because it's so important to us for all the mental health supports we can provide in our schools. And by the way, we have probably more than anyone around us as far as school districts go. Friends matter more, way more. Especially if they're friends who are focused on, you know, um, productive and healthy developmental things, right? So this is what we're trying to work on. And we're, we have a lot going on and we're constantly telling kids, you got an idea for a club? Tell us what it is and we'll see if we can help you find an advisor. So I want to show you this, because this, as we tackle attendance, right? 
This is a look at North and Tartan High School. And again, this is last school year. But what you'll notice is, obviously during the pandemic, we had a dramatic dip in participation rates. We're not back up to doing pandemic levels yet, but we're getting there. See what I'm saying? Because like, and those clubs, activities, and sports have to change with the times too. Uh, some of us were really involved last year in advocating with the Minnesota High School League to um, make boys volleyball a Minnesota State High School League sanctioned sport. Because if you think about it, it's always for girls in Minnesota, unlike other states up until now, has not recognized it as a state-sponsored sport for boys. That's who plays a lot of boys volleyball in the Twin Cities, among boys in particular. Any of the parks, and I know the cities pay attention to these as well, if you go to our parks and you look in the summertime, people are playing pickup games of volleyball all the time. We already have like over 100 kids involved in our boys volleyball team, and it's not even yet officially sponsored by the state yet. We've been working toward it, so it's really exciting, and it gets people, we have to pay attention to what kids love. You know what else is really picking up energy and steam is badminton. It's become really popular, net sports in general. Um, so these are, those are just all activities in sports. These are just act athletes and activities. Um, I want to mention another thing too. You've probably heard, like, in fact, we were just talking about when Melissa was just in, healthcare and education, there's a real shortage in the workforce, and it's true. We, all, we work really hard in our district, as we always tell our pupils. People don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. Bethany's been a great boss of our Tartan. She's doing great. But it's true, right? People, especially right now, when there's a labor market like there is, we need to make everyone want to work here and make them want to stay. And so we do, we're doing a lot of things differently. We're not just doing exit interviews when someone leaves. We're doing stay interviews. Why do you stay here? What is keeping you here? And you can imagine there's all kinds of different reasons for that. But um, I want you to know that we are still hiring. Um, for people who are interested, I know there's a lot of people who are going to become a bus driver, right? But it's not, it's, it's really not, if you can manage it, it's a great paying job, limited hours, and we'll get you trained. You just need to show up, we'll get you trained up, get you a CL license, and get you on your way. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities there. One thing I wanted to mention is that with the shortage out there, um, our greatest need is for teachers of special education. As needs grow, with special education needs. Um, and I have a theory about that, I'm just gonna share. If you think about back in the day when I was born in 1973, premature babies didn't make it. Now we have all these medical developments and kids are making it, and sometimes they're making it and they have some special needs that come with that, which is great because we know early intervention is the best way. And it's amazing how well a fragile little baby can be doing in 18 years and you know, taking the world by storm. But we also know that early intervention and programming counts with that. So, um, a lot of districts around the metro, and we're, we're getting on deck to do the same, we're looking to hire international teachers. Now, I've hired a lot of international teachers over the years for immersion programs, during my time in St. Paul schools. But I've not hired international teachers for special education before. And the reason for that is because special education doesn't exist the same way in other countries, right? In our country, every child has a right to a free and appropriate education. In a lot of other places, um, you can out, right? Uh, and they don't fit the mold. And so we don't always see a lot of success with international teachers, but there are some school districts around the metro who've been hiring some incredibly qualified teachers from the Philippines. And I've been talking to some superintendents who've been doing this, and they are telling me that some of the people they're interviewing they aren't even having to give an interview to someone who has less than 10 years of special education teaching experience, a master's degree, and in most cases, even a PhD in special education. And so apparently, their similar, their system is similar enough with ours. They've come here and they're being successful. So um, we're going to give that a whirl. If you have any interest in helping us be part of a welcome wagon, um, we'll let you know in another couple of months how many you might be bringing on board. But, we're part of a lot of school districts around the Twin City, so I have a feeling in the, in the near future we're going to see a lot. I even heard Red Lake, Red Lake Schools, the Indian Reservation, is hire a whole bunch of Filipino teachers, so no, we're not the only ones thinking about it, but apparently they've been successful so far. So, um, And what's great about them is they come fully licensed. There's no, like, we have to give them the license. They come fully licensed. 
and um, the districts we're working with have been bringing H1B visa, yeah. and they're able to bring the family members with them, so their children can come too. So. It could be a fun, a fun um, event, and our teacher union is really on board, willing to help us welcome everyone and do the airport pickups and all that kind of stuff. So, I also wanted to share with you just our e-news. If you don't receive our district e-news, this is something that comes out generally about every week, sometimes every other week. It's just an email newsletter. Um, if you want to scan this QR code, um, you can always send a message to communications at ic 62org and we'll get you signed up to receive from newsy bits. Um, but there's a lot always going on, but it'll keep you posted about school plays and carnivals and other events that are happening around town. So I'm keeping it short because I know that our time is tight, but I really wanted to have more time for questions. Um, I should mention Tartan High School is our last major construction project. It won't be done until uh, a year from this August, September, um, but it's going to be amazing. It's already going to be amazing, but it's very noisy over there, and it's inconvenient to work around um, construction. But this part we're going to be ceremony for North High School, which is all done, and that's been pretty exciting too. So, um, if you've been watching some of the changes around the district, we're really proud of them, and um, and our enrollment is ticking back up again. We had an extra 300 kids arrive this year, and we're like, wow, this is great news. So, we're feeling good about that. Um, I just want to take a moment and see what kind of questions you might have, thoughts, wonderings. So how are you handling the, the impact of phones in schools? Great question. So phones in schools, there's it's so interesting. There's even legislation being proposed that schools have plans. We um we basically have plans at each site that are specific to each school. Phones need to be put away during class time, um, and we're keeping kids trying to keep kids off phones during school. But at the same time. We don't have a phones aren't allowed system at all at this point, but I think I read, isn't it Indiana? I think just passed a law banning <coughs> schools, like the whole state or somewhere. I just read a news about that. Um, it's a constant issue, but I think our biggest concern is we also need to teach kids how to navigate, um, how to turn off social media, how to not get sucked in, how to like handle the pressure our kids are under is just off the charts, and it doesn't end at the end of the school day. At home, there's a lot of communication going on. Anything you want to add about phones with that type? Um, at the middle school? I'm sorry. Here. I'm, I'm going to give a microphone. I'll speak really loudly in the middle. Well, for the recording, maybe. Oh, gotcha. Sorry, um, just, if you don't have a type. Assistant superintendent. I'm Ty Thompson. Um, our middle schools actually have their own procedure where they call it away for the day. So students are supposed to keep their phones away. Um, most comply, obviously yes. kids are impulsive, so sometimes they might want to sneak a peek or do whatever, and there's a process for them to turn into the teacher. Um, but we don't have an overall policy yet. Yep. You'll see teachers that will have like those pocket charts in their classroom, and every kid has to go up and put their phone in a pocket chart. So if I'm sitting at my seat, I can see my phone, I know where it is, but I can't touch it. Yeah. Uh, great presentation. I really like the things you're doing. Mm -hmm. Society changes. Uh, Melissa's in charge with a lot of uh, career pathways for students, and that's one of my roles with the county. Mm -hmm. and you you addressed the need for careers, and I, I'd like to see you continue to identify with all the cultures to expose the kids that it's great if someone goes to a four-year college, but Maybe some kids need exposure to the trades, mm -hmm. or you mentioned medical and nursing. Oh, yeah. And even at the middle school level, so I'd like to see it continue to do that. In fact, I'd like to see the nation or the states uh, where you would I, you would track the kids, and after five years of being out of, of the high school, what are they up to? Actually, so that to me is the real success. We actually have that data. It's called SLEDS data. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's it's not as tight as it could be, but we do, the state is actually tracking that. Student longitudinal educational data, I'm trying to think what SLED stands for, yeah. But yeah, we do have that, which is post high school. And we spend a lot of time, and you've heard Melissa speak about this quite a bit, which is why I didn't go too much into it here today, but our students, if you haven't seen some of the amazing programs, like they build a house every year in North St. Paul from the ground up, it's amazing. and. You know, kids are building not just using 3D printers, they build their own 3D printers. And there's amazing things. And, and Melissa's done a great job with her counterpart at North, too, to bring in 
um, this program called Youth Science, which allows us to do some interest inventory and skill testing with kids is beginning in eighth grade, right? We're starting at eighth and beyond. And what's great about that program is kids then get this, this uh, assessment done, and they get to keep that data with them even post-graduation to kind of help guide them into where they want to head and do pathways. It's helping kids find what they're interested in, where their skills lie, and it's a combination of both. But you, we also don't want to track kids and say, you're going to be a plumber, right? We want to give kids opportunities to try different things, and that's, that's what's so important about it. Thank you. Yeah. Steve, uh, first off, I'll second about, you know, sit on the board with this one right behind me. She's yeah. got fabulous. I know. I'm gonna tell you, it's uh, been nothing but great. She's, she's engaged us with mm -hmm. this business being unlike anybody in the past. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm gonna put that spot. Second, what is the district doing? You know, we always see the news stories that, boy, there's gonna be this five or 10 year remediation lag to make up for pandemic shutdowns in schools. What? What's the district doing to try to counter that learning gap that was the result? Absolutely. That's a great question. We have put so many extra programs in place, lots more after school programs. We're the, one of the only school districts around that I'm even aware of who still has a late bus home. So if you stay after school, um, we're also working with kids. If you fail a class, not waiting until summer to take a makeup credit, you start right away after school. We can get you caught up right on the spot and, and move forward more quickly. Lots, we call it in uh, what I mean time, or lean time we have in our schools, which allows you to get extra tutoring in the areas that you have need. We're so much more data driven than we ever have been before in terms of pinpointing every single child's reading level, math level, um, and also teams of teachers, we created time so that they can really look at the data and figure out where there's gaps not only with academic learning but social emotional development as well. So our summer programs, we literally have 230,000 students that participate in the summer programs. And we only have under 11,000. So there's a lot of students in our summer programs and after school as well. 41 seconds to go. <laughs> yeah, Christine, this, this is fantastic. And I don't know if most of you have taken a look at this, but um, I'm iffy as a fourth grader and uh, not smarter than fourth grade. <laughs> We also have these in multiple languages, printed in many languages as well. It is true though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. One last question. You had the data up at the front about uh, attendance. Mm -hmm. That was 400 and some 12th graders that were more than 10%. Mm -hmm. What's the total amount of 12th graders in part of the It'd be about, what, 900 between the two? Yeah. 8, 900? A little less than that. About 400 per grade per school. I think I knew that answer, but I just wanted to make sure people understood how much that. Number it's a lot. It's a lot. And I'll tell you what. Um, actually, I was just talking with. Um, I was on a panel this morning talking about graduation rates, and they were asking, well, "What happened to truancy officers in the counties? Our counties, and I'm sure Stan can tell you, are just backed up too, right? I mean, there's just so much need out there, and they're short staffed, and then they're backlogged, and it's. It kind of needs to be everyone hands on deck to try to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. One more? Okay, one more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll hand it over and step aside. Okay. Go ahead. Um, the question is um, what the several employers that I meet with uh, talk about in hiring is who they can trust. Oh, yeah. Is there a trust relationship between those who are, are learning? to be honest with each other, trust each other, uh, projects and different things. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing that I think I'm most proud of as a superintendent. We have an excellent relationship with our teacher union. We do everything together. We plan together all the time. We're very, very supportive of each other. Um, and, and that is probably, I think, what makes us kind of unique. I, that's not the case. If you hear the news around us all the time, we have really worked hard on that. And there's a lot of trust because we work a lot on that in our leadership development with anyone throughout our organization. Um, we have about 2,000 employees, and I'd like to remind people, only 700 are teachers. All these other jobs exist, accountants, mechanics, we have an architect, we have all kinds of things, and they are not teachers. So um, we have to make sure that all departments are talking to each other and feel like every voice matters. We work really hard on that, and I would say that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of, that people feel pretty strongly connected to the organization. Thanks for that question.